Hello. Hello, hello. How are you guys? Welcome to Final Junkies, broadcast number eight. New gear, same old shit. You'll notice that the, the setup is a little bit different. That's because I'm attempting to record through a... <clears throat> I'm attempting to record through a uh, different mic and through a soundboard, and I'm really hoping that I'm not going to catch any um, technical difficulties because of it, but it'll be a little while, but we'll figure it out. Hey, guys. Oh. <clears throat> Whoa. So, yeah, I got to admit that uh, before today, I didn't even know that I was going to be using this board because before today, I shit you not, I did not know how to use the soundboard or any of it. I've tried and it didn't work, but through the help of uh, Todd and Eric and a few people at Vinyl Junkies, uh, we got together and we finally got this to work. So isn't that special? All right, so what do we talk about now? Okay, VJ News. Why don't we start there? By the way, no, actually, you know what? Let's talk about uh, our sponsors. Let's pay our bills and let's talk about what's really exciting about this week, which is that you get to visit Vinyl Me Please directly, pick your prize, and boom. If you get chosen, um, you win your prize. So this week's bod uh, podcast, podcast, this week's podcast is brought to you by Vinyl Me Please. Go visit their web store at app.vinylmeplease.com. Pick your prize. Web shop just opened, and it's open to members and non-members. The good thing about members, do you want to know what it is? And it's probably the thing that, uh, for me, is a deal breaker. They uh, include your extra records in your shipping, right? So if you're subscribed to the album of the month, and you pick whatever, you pick uh, the John Lee Hooker record here, or you pick other records, they don't charge you extra for the shipping. It's all included in the same box. They deliver it to you with the same box, and you save a bunch on shipping. That, to me, is a big deal breaker. Also, I mean, the, the, the prices are right. Anyway, look, I'm going to get into the VMP picks just a little bit later, uh, but I'm very excited. Go check it out. Again, listen, it's for podcast subscribers, okay? So please check out the podcast at uh, vinyljunkies.co slash podcast uh, if you have itunes or google play or any of those just look for vinyl junkies and subscribe to it because those are the guys that win the prizes you know so now we have one more sponsor that i'd like to welcome and uh see this here you notice how everything's just way more uh, schnazzy that's because this is a uh, vinyl record holder uh, from Flipbin. So Flipbin are new sponsors and I'll be using their product. And uh, look, my feeling is it's really good, but I just got it a couple of days ago. So I want to put it through the runs and kind of like see exactly where it is that I find it's useful or not. We both know it's never going to replace Expedits, right? But uh, before you offer a product review, we see. So yeah, Flipbin, welcome aboard, man. I'm enjoying so far. And Soundsmith. Soundsmith, I will have to click to the other one to get the pre-rolls, but I will. Precision Fono Cartridges, car handcrafted by experts in upstate New York. Visit Soundsmith, sound, slash, smith, dot com. So yeah, we got that all out of the way. Now, we're going to get into records, okay? That's why we're here. Cool. Let's get into records. First review that I want to do is uh, something that I'm pretty excited about. I was excited about, but um, I finally got uh, the first record from uh, Vinyl Me Please's curated add-on pack. Uh, they call it the Classics series. And uh, the whole idea there is that you don't get to pick the record, but they go into old, you know, classic jazz and blues and uh, soul and that kind of thing. And you just add it on. The first four really excited me, right? Because, I mean... Look back there, right? You see that whole wall of orange and black. I'm an enormous fan of Impulse Records. I, you know, to me, it's uh, it's my favorite jazz label and very possibly my favorite label. Uh, period. So the fact that three of four of their first uh, classics were all on Impulse is something that excited me greatly. They had the Archie Shep. There's this one that you see in the background. It served you right to suffer, John Lee Hooker. 
brilliant. And uh, there's another one coming up from Alice Coltrane, uh, Journey in Sachidananda, which I already have, but I'm curious to see, uh, do a head-to-head to see what uh, the classics pressing uh, will be, uh, you know, in difference, let's say, between that and the copy that I have. So um, first off, if I can put this in front of you, but more, I think it's for me to have a look at, but um, I'm a little bit of a pain in the ass when it comes to collecting uh, old records, because I think that uh, it's important to respect the format of an old record. Okay, especially when you're talking uh, in the age of vinyl records, the sleeves didn't just happen by accident. It, you know, the uh, order of the songs, we've been th- through this before. Everything, because it's put on physical format, everything is based on, uh, you know, it's planned out. So when you get an impulse record and you see that the impulse record has a gorgeous gatefold like this, to me, it's very important to be able to say that if you're going to consider yourself a classics label, stay very, very, very uh, true to the original format. That's to say that for better or for worse, you may disagree with me, but in terms of colored vinyl, no colored vinyl. Look, Impulse Records wasn't released on colored vinyl. Blue Note Records wasn't released on colored vinyl. Give me a black slab. You want to do something really good with it? Put it on 180 gram solid vinyl. That'll make me happy as a collector. And for fuck's sake, do not mess around with the packaging, especially when you're talking about labels like uh, Impulse or CTI or Deutsche Grammophon or any of these. So much thought is put into the way it is that they package this stuff. Don't change it. If the record came out as a gatefold, especially let's say with a company like Impulse, make sure that it stays gatefold. I say this because sometimes when you see uh, reissues, you don't see that, right? So in this case, Vinyl Me Please really hit the nail on the head. I should say that it's the only one of four classics that I did uh, get. So there was the Archie Shep that hasn't come in yet. Uh, I wasn't really clear. There didn't seem to be a very smooth rollout when it came to how this classics works. And there wasn't a lot of information, which to me was disappointing because... I mean, I'm a jazz head, right? That's the stuff that I like the most. This stuff actually excites me more than the album of the month because the album of the month has kind of like that crapshoot thing where you might not like something. Of course, yes, you can switch to other records, but if you're going to do classics, make sure that you do it 100%. And uh, if you're going to add something, don't be fancy. Make sure that um, it respects the format. And that's really where... Vinyl Me Please, I think, uh, added a great deal to the vinyl experience uh, where they took the John Lee Hooker record. It served you right to suffer. They were faithful to the cover. They were they provided the gatefold. But there's also a little yellow booklet that came in uh, that's an add-on with extra liner notes that uh, gives you a little bit of a blow-by-blow of every song on the album and provides you with context as to how this record came to be. And that to me is the reason that you would take such a thing because those liner notes were perfect. Uh, They weren't overly blustery, blustery, which is to say that, uh, you know, they respected the format. They respected the fact that this is an old record and we're talking about it way after the time. Uh, And they provided fantastic uh, background and they were well-written. Basically I found myself, Taking a look at the little booklet, and I'm sorry, I don't have it here for the camera because I forgot because I was busy doing this whole thing with uh, the new setup, but I'll have it for next time, okay? But if a vinyl record can have me just back up, right, and go through the gatefold and enjoy the pictures and enjoy the liner notes, and if you're adding to that experience, then you've nailed it. VMP nailed it. In terms of product, it's 100%. In terms of rollout, I still don't know. I, I, I wish there was more on it um, because it's honestly something that I love. And I'm pretty sure that if they did the same type of thing for hip hop or you know metal or that kind of thing, they might find an audience there as well. So uh, bravo. In terms of the record, look, 
do we really have to talk about John Lee Hooker? Do I have to tell you that he's awesome? John Lee Hooker is one of the original, uh, you know, Delta men. So uh, this one came out in 1965 and he's got some jazz uh, session musicians around him, but it's, it's fucking perfect. The pressing is perfect. Mind you, it should be said that all impulse pressings sound fantastic, which kind of brings me to my next uh, review, which is Red Clay. Uh, to me, this is a record, uh, this Freddie Hubbard record, uh, Red Clay on CTI, is a record that's absolutely necessary. Like if you have a jazz collection with, let's say, a dozen records, this is one of the records I would put in there. Not because you have to make any type of comparison to uh, John Coltrane or Miles Davis or Art Blakey or any of those guys. Those guys have their own thing, but if you want a little bit of variety in your collection, Freddie Hubbard in the 60s and while he was recording with Blue Note, uh, he was mostly of the hard bop um, school, right? So trumpeter. And uh, so, you know, he was still following the style that was there. Of course, he was setting the pace, but he was setting the pace within other ensembles and, uh, you know, playing post bop. Red Clay, he joins CTI in 1970 and moves away from that altogether and just completely sets the fucking pace for the entire label. And I say without any hesitation that CTI Records is one of my absolute favorite fucking labels out there. Uh, it's crack to me. I'll collect all of it because it's all good. Now, is there a link between Impulse Records and CTI? Yeah, there's a huge link. Uh, the link is called Creed Taylor, the producer of all of these records. Got his bones. He, he started at Impulse and eventually left and took that entire aesthetic and that entire um, attention to detail and precision and brought it over to his new label, CTI Records. So in other words, you know the nice thick sleeves? You're going to have the thick sleeves in CTI also. The gatefolds, yep, that's there too impeccable recording impeccable like bernie grundman like you know huge engineers impeccable these records sound amazing i can't i can't understate that so now i've had this record for a while it should be said though that i had a little bit of trouble finding red clay because um it's kind of got two big things going for it as far as i'm concerned look i mean it's opinion right and other people can definitely disagree if they want to but I mean, if you have to ask me, I would say an argument can very easily be made that Red Clay is uh, the crown jewel of the CTI catalog. You know, it's really the one that set the pace going forward and just uh, the cornerstone of that catalog. It's evergreen material as far as I'm concerned, right? Um, the double thing to that, and I've heard it said, and I can't say I disagree, I kind of definitely get the argument, is there's some people that'll say that... Um, Red Clay is the uh, cornerstone of Freddie Hubbard's career. And that's saying a lot, right? Because, I mean, <laughs> the dude recorded with some massive cats during the 60s. You know, his Blue Note catalog is legendary. But 1970, he set the pace for something completely different. And he... Uh... Look, man, if I go pick a Freddie Hubbard record when I put him on, I go to Red Clay. I go to the CTI catalog for the most part. I'll listen to some of the Blue Note stuff. I'll listen to Hubcap, but, you know, that's that's it. Now, when it comes to the review, this is the interesting part for me. Just let me have a drink, okay? Hope you're enjoying it, by the way. Do you hear me properly? Yeah, I forgot to trim my mustache, right? So I, when you take a sip of beer, I'll, like some of the beer stays in the mustache, and so you, you know, and you kind of like suck the beer. I got beer remnants in my mustache. So let's get back to this review. I have an original of Red Clay. I actually had three different versions of Red Clay. Okay, the first version I ever had was the 80s version, and that didn't do it for me at all for a few reasons. The first reason is, can you hear this? I just want to see something. Sorry, just give me a sec, okay? <laughs> it sounds awesome. Oh, okay, good. 
I because I see like some frowny faces and I see some uh, smiley faces, so I'm wondering if maybe it's because I fucked everything up, which is possible. I'm a dumbass, you know. Let's admit. Let's get back to the review, can we? Okay, so red clay. I've had three different versions of red clay. The first one was an '80s reissue, which didn't satisfy me at all because it didn't meet one of the primary criteria. That criteria is it didn't come in a gatefold. Red clay is gatefold. Period. Right? So this here, okay, it opens up. And this part in here is very important. So important to the aesthetic. So important to getting the record property. And it's not just the music. Listen, if it's just the music, listen to it on fucking Spotify. We, we're vinyl people, right? So the vinyl experience is what we talk about. Uh, if we're talking vinyl experience, then the gatefold is an important, important, important part of the CTI experience. So important that uh, they would have notes uh, inside, you know, they would say, listen, if you want the cover, if you want a poster, you know, of uh, the inside uh, gatefold, send us a dollar and we'll send you the poster. That's how much they placed stock in that. So you don't remove a gatefold. Uh, from the aesthetic of a label that thought the gatefold was extremely important. Impulse and CTI were predicated on quality. We do not fuck with that. You don't put budget tires on a Ferrari. You don't do it. Well, you know. Okay. Now, number two. Um, Org Music's version. There were a couple of things. Org Music's version uh, is a two... LP version, okay, you know the super deluxe analog stuff, right? 45 RPM. Now, I thought to myself, this is going to be interesting because I've never heard a CTI record that sounds bad. It doesn't exist. They all sound amazing, okay? You want your sound system to really sound the way it's supposed to sound? Put on a CTI record. It's simple. It's that good. So, um, when somebody tries to sell an um, an audiophile version of something that I consider to be audiophile already, it's like, eesh, that's a tough one, right? Because the records already sound good. So I dropped the needle and I did the head-to-head -head maybe, what, a couple of days ago or whatever. I mean, it's a record I know very well, but I dropped the, uh, the needle on uh, my original. I had originally, uh, I had uh, eventually found an original copy with a gatefold. Serge Blanchette, a fellow VJ member, uh, traded it to me. I'm sure I gave him something good in return. Um, but uh, so I finally got my original copy. So for me, is audiophile even necessary for a record that already sounds great? Okay, let's find out. Why would you do it? The first thing is, again, I think it's a cornerstone record. So, you know, just like you would buy Bitches Brew and spend money on the pro, uh, you know, on the best or you buy a uh, Love Supreme, or whatever, you know the argument. I think it, it, it belongs in that category, in my opinion. So I dropped the needle on Red Clay. I just played the entire thing, which is just like it's the, the, the title track is, what, 13 minutes long or something. So I figure that'd be enough, right? Get back in my chair, drop the needle, listen to the entire thing. And, okay. Uh, so then take it off, put the 45, and kind of close my eyes so that I can kind of, you know, because I'm not expecting a difference here. I'm not expecting a difference. It's like, it's going to be hard for me to give a review. There was a difference. There was a difference. Uh, the clarity of the instruments was there. There's no question. Will it make a difference if you have a, uh, you know, a Stanton T60 turntable or that kind of thing? No, it's not going to make a difference. Is it going to make a difference on a Crosley? No. Let's be clear. These are audiophile pressings. They cost more, and uh, they promise something. Thing is, is with every industry, sometimes the promises that people make don't really deliver. So I was very skeptical. Uh, and it becomes doubly difficult when Org Music is your sponsor. But Listen, there's a difference. I, I invite you to come to the record cave and listen for yourself. I'm pretty sure that you're going to hear a difference. Okay, uh, I don't even know how that's possible when you have an already amazing quality recording, no matter what you get. Even the 80s stuff with the like the thin vinyl, the reissues there, those sounded good too. They all sound good. But um, 
you know, I guess the question becomes, does the audio file, if you are willing to spend that money for an audio file pressing of something that you love, is it worth it? Is MoFi, Mobile Fidelity, the only ones or analog productions? Does org stand up? Org stands up. Yeah, there's no, no, no question in my mind that there is a difference there. So uh, buy with confidence. The other thing uh, that I will say just to wrap up this review is the two times 45 thing. Now, again, because I'm kind of a traditionalist when it comes to vinyl, I uh, have two thoughts with that. Side one and side two, when the record came out, if it's that's the way it sounds, that's the way the artist wanted it to sound. So there's a certain sequence that you disturb. The minute it is that you go the audiophile route and put it over a lot of records, okay? That can be a big thing. Let's say if you're going to do it, let's say with a Rolling Stones record or a Led Zeppelin record, and fuck, you're going to listen to the Led Zeppelin 4 or whatever, you want it to sound, you want it to have side one and side two. That's the entire point. That went into the idea. The minute it is that you do that 45 RPM, I think in some cases it could work, okay? Because a lot of times what they would do is cram music into the side, you know, based on limitation, but sometimes they'd kind of like just make a decision to kind of like stretch it a little bit. So the inner grooves don't sound quite as... Uh, good as uh, the outer grooves um, and in that particular case the extra space okay you know you kind of give up authenticity but you're getting something in return i would say that that's the case here in uh, on red clay because well like i said the title track which is the big song that's kind of, you know it's been sampled to death uh you know uh, including by a tribe called quest but um to hear that song completely stretched out over one side that was good, man. Uh, I can definitely see why uh, anyone would pick this up. So that's my review of audiophile pressings. It depends. Don't mess with the format, but sometimes the format is limiting. So if the format makes it sound better and... Uh, I'm not going to repeat anything. Holy fuck, do you see how white my tongue is? What's next? I will be speaking to Peter Lederman of Soundsmith Cartridges to go over some terms. We haven't figured out the format exactly, uh, whether we'll do it over the telephone or we can even do a video. He promised uh, that we could do a video tutorial. Now, look, Peter Letterman's um, been doing cartridges for uh, 30, 40 years, a hell of a long time. And he uh, suggested that he can make a video for us showing vertical tracking force, showing anti-skate, how to adjust all that stuff. Uh, you know, um, the other terms aren't coming to mind, but I was supposed to mention four of them. Azimuth is the other one, and then VTA. What does VTA stand for again? Okay. As you can tell, I'm not very much of a techie, and that's why uh, I will enjoy these Vinyl 101 type discussions as much as you will, because uh, I stand to learn a whole lot from it. You know, and when you got a guy teaching you who makes cartridges for a living, handmade, and he owns a, a cutting lathe so he knows the insides and outs of everything, it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what there is to learn. So in terms of format, what would you guys like? I'm assuming that you'd probably like a video. Uh, let's see if we can't do that for you. Okay. Um, so there's that. I will also mention that... Um, they sent a funnel preamp. I'm not ready to review it yet, but my stereo sounds better now than it's ever sounded before. Model, what, MMP3, MK2, whatever. Okay, but that's Red Clay. Uh, part three, now we're going to start going into member store picks. Is that what we're doing? Let me have a look at my own notes, all right? Can we chat about jazz sometime, Jeremy? Yes, of course we can chat about jazz, man. It's what I do. I love it. You see all this stuff here, this all gets clicked out um, for the podcast, okay? So the whole thing with live is that you do get to see it live, but I, but you on the other hand, you see me kind of futzing around, right? Which sucks. Here we go. 
what did I say I was going to talk about? Freddie Hubbard. Okay, yeah, so now we're going to go into um, record store picks from uh, the August record store from Vinyl Me, please. And what's fun about it is that it'll just allow me to talk music. It's really as simple as that, man, because uh, there's a lot of great stuff. One thing that came in last week is uh, this right here from Light in the Attic. The Supreme Jubilees. When I saw that in the store, uh, I immediately knew that that's something that I wanted. Light in the Attic is a label that I trust very uh, greatly when it comes to curation. And I knew that if they were going to put out a record from a gospel band, there'd have to be something to it. It just can't be. And the thing is, a lot of gospel music is just straight up funk, man. Uh, just nastiness and that's what it is that we're hearing here. It's funk. It's soul. The voices just, it doesn't matter what you believe in. It's good music. Do you like good soul, funk, R&B? They sing about Jesus, but the music is amazing. Um, so yeah, that's there. A record that I would very highly suggest if you like that kind of thing. Um, probably the record that excites me the most is um, Sister Rosetta Tharp. They're putting out a red marble vinyl, limited to a thousand, live in 1960. Again, to go into the gospel thing, right? Because it's like she was a badass mama, played guitar, and had a set of pipes on her. And I'm not sure I've ever seen a Sister Rosetta Tharp record uh, in a record store. It's not like I don't look. I look. I've looked for this for a long time. As a matter of fact, I remember that uh, Emily Ruth Harold and I had a conversation specifically about that and uh, still haven't found it. So I'm overjoyed to see that Live in 1960 is finally uh, getting pressed to vinyl by org music, no less. That's a big one uh, for me. For those of you that just like uh, blues, gospel, R&B, same thing with a killer voice and just someone who can play guitar, Cicero's at a tharp, man. You want it. Another big one for me is, uh, I don't know what label. You see, again, this is a complaint that I've had with that store sometimes. It's important to know the label that the records are out on. There's a Joe Henderson and Alice Coltrane record, The Element. I need this record. Like, for th th there's no way I can not have this. So I want to be able to go search for this record. I got to know what label it's on. And it makes a difference if it's on impulse it tells me something if it's on solid state it tells me something if it's on blue note it tells me something this is all information that i think is essential when it is that you're buying a record especially when you're talking about records that cost 30 40 50 bucks even more right so yeah jo joe henderson alice coltrane the element want it don't know what label i wish i could say more but just as an aside uh joe henderson plays on um he plays saxophone on uh Red Clay on Freddie Hubbard, Red Clay, and uh, Herbie Hancock's on that as well. Um, yeah, that good. Then there's one that came out last month, uh, but I haven't looked at it, but I've noticed that uh, many uh, people have been uh, giving positive reviews to uh, Bad Bad Not Good's uh, recent 2LP comp, Late Night Tales. I don't know what that's all about, but I'm kind of like the feeling that I'm getting, it's kind of like those uh, DJ Kicks sessions or Back to Mine or just, you know, where they get uh, artists to uh, compile old stuff uh, or, you know, the Mark Farina stuff and so forth. But I've heard some good things and I like Bad Bad Not Good. So that's one that I'm curious about. I know a couple of you already have it. What do you think? If you can, please post it up with a link. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who's curious. Then, the War on Drugs new record. Fuck do I need this, right? Slave Ambient is uh, the new one. It's going to be coming out. They're releasing it in two different things. There's a bundle that bundles Slave Ambient with a deeper understanding. I don't have both of them. So, um, the War on Drugs is a big one. For jazz fans, Art Blakey Quintet, a 10-inch. I have this love affair with 10-inches. I just... Uh -huh, that's what she said. Um... <laughs> It's a nice format to play. It's a neat format, man. When you take them out, it's just... Uh, and I have shelves. It's, I know, it's a weird thing. But I got shelves that fit 10 inches. That's what she said. Uh, 
So I kind of like having that one shelf filled up properly. That's what she said. <laughs> That's what she said. Uh, oh my fucking God. Juvenile. So juvenile. And my daughter watches this. I am ashamed. Shame. Ding, ding. All right. So yeah. Art Blakey Quintet 10 inch. I want that. That's what she said. <laughs> okay. They've been doing um, hip hop really well. And it's been informing my decisions and it's really been filling out my collection. And what's fun is that it seems like. Uh, 30 somethings are the ones doing a lot of the curation, which means a lot of the stuff that came out in the 90s, which went over my head, just flew over my radar for a variety of reasons, is what they're introducing me to. So, Super Dupa Fly, which is still there, is, you know, made me realize that I need every Missy Elliott record. So, I welcome being reintroduced to this music and I welcome this idea that people are handpicking the best of the best and you know providing a curated store I like that there's a difference between that and an Amazon you know um, so Big Daddy Kane uh, is another one which I don't have I know Big Daddy Thing but there's Long Live the Kane is it good that's something I would take a chance on because they've done it right so then there's an Eric Dolphy record called Outward Bound, and uh, the uh, deal with Eric Dolphy is that anything you see, you buy. I don't know the label for this specifically, but Eric Dolphy played with uh, John Coltrane, and he played with uh, Thelonious Monk, and his solo stuff is pretty legendary. He died too soon, and... Um, he was he, he would have been a really good successor, another successor with Pharaoh Sanders to um, John Coltrane's legacy, but that never happened. Sucks. But if you want to get into a Miles Davis quote, uh, Miles Davis got in trouble with a uh, Eric Dolphy quote, just to kind of give you of maybe uh, you know why this is not the type of jazz you might want to go with. But um, right after he died. Uh, they interviewed Miles Davis for some magazine and they, you know, asked him to comment on the death of Eric Dolphy, to which he replied that uh, he sounded like someone stepped on his foot and he pissed off a lot of people with that quote because, you know, Miles Davis. That's Miles Davis. Uh, am I the only guy here who likes strut um, Afro pop uh, compilations? I collect a lot of that Afro pop stuff. I love. Every label that puts it out, Analog Africa is one of my favorites. Strut is one that really just consistently nails it out of the park. They have one that was available last week, but Pop Makosa, which is uh, dance music from Cameroon from the mid-60s to the mid-80s. Of course, it's going to be good, right? The Nationals' new record, Sleep Well Beast, is coming out Uh they, uh, the, 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 when Vinyl Me Please put out Boxer, which I don't think is available anymore, but um, uh, when they put out Boxer, they gave a single uh, which gave listeners two uh, exclusive songs off the new record. Those were really good. Now, will it have this whole thing of being a grower? Like, will it give me the same experience that Boxer did? I don't know. I'm new to the national. So as far as I'm concerned, I still have to go backward and really appreciate what uh, Alligator is all about before I can even start speaking about anything else. But uh, I'm curious. Sir, uh, I'm certainly curious. Uh, Betty Paget. This one's an interesting one, a soul record. And um, what's interesting about it is that it's soul with a little bit of a reggae-fied beat. So... It's got like this late 70s, early 80s, it seems, kind of like reggae-fied beat, uh, which I enjoyed, you know. Want some more Afropop? There's uh, Apples, which I believe is now again. Apples, an Afropop band. Uh, not Afropop, uh, Afrofunk, Afrorock. Mind Twister is the name of the album. Wells Fargo is still there, so if you want some Zamrock, watch out. Queens of the Stone Age. Can I um, be honest about Queens of the Stone Age? The only record that I really ever super, super got into was Songs for the Deaf, which I liked. I heard Rated R. I heard some of the stuff after, but that's the one that I really liked. Um, I'm not even... Anyway, 
the new record's out. They got two iterations of it, the single and super deluxe whatever. And if you haven't picked it up yet, if it's there, Jesus, guys, ghetto brothers. Uh, when that sells out, you are going to absolutely regret having uh, not picked it up when you had a chance. It's that good. I'm not going to be talking anymore because uh, I spent most of my time trying to put all of this together. I hope you enjoyed the podcast or broadcast. I hope it sounds good. Um, Please subscribe by going uh, to iTunes or Google Play or whatever you listen to your music on. Look for Vinyl Junkies under the podcast and subscribe because that's where I pick the winners. And, you know, I am picking winners today, right? There's going to be two winners, as a matter of fact. Um, Why don't we go to them right now? Thank you uh, once again to Vinyl Me Please for making uh, the prizes available. You can visit uh, the store yourself. As a matter of fact, you know what? I'm going to give away one prize now, and I'm going to give another one away. I'm going to announce it on Monday or Tuesday when I put out the podcast. So it'll give you a chance to just listen to the whole thing, visit properly, and uh, anticipation to hear at the end of the podcast who actually wins. Why don't we do it that way? We'll pick one winner today, and we're going to pick the second winner uh, when I download, uh, when I upload the podcast. If you want to listen directly, you can listen at vinyljunkies.co slash podcast now winner 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 chicken dinner oh fuck that's a lot of names who do we pick so many good names all right guys um we're gonna go with david ford david ford uh you just want a record go to uh, app.vinylmeplease.com Pick your record and we'll get it to you. Eric will uh, reach you for your details. We will pick another winner. I do see the others. Um, We will pick another winner among subscribers and uh, downloaders, listeners. I can check all that stuff out. So, uh, you know, look on iTunes, look on Google Play, all the rest of this. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry if it was a bit skimpy on content, but uh, my head was kind of like in two different things. You know, it was kind of like on the techie side and on the material side. Uh, With a little bit of patience, we're going to get all of this right. I'm curious to see myself uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, whether Facebook will swallow this broadcast up again, because that's what they do. God knows why. And number two, what it sounds like. I don't even know myself, man. This is a dry run. As a matter of fact, I woke up not even thinking that I was going to do this. So we'll see. Interviews are still happening. Grail's interview is still going to happen. Uh, Grail's talk. Mogwai's new records coming out in two weeks, so there's going to be a little bit of Mogwai talk and uh, more. Let's see, okay? So enjoy, and um, it's time for me to go, man. Later. Holy fuck, did I just kiss into the phone? Can I tell you just a little story, okay? Uh, As a dad, one of the best things that you ever want to do is you want to make your kid laugh. You want to feel like king, king of the universe, what you do is you make a kid laugh. There's nothing in the world. So I would do, and I still do a lot of really stupid things in order to make my kid laugh, because if I can, it's cool. But she used to have a teddy bear, right? So I would kind of like invent songs and just use whatever, right? So I'd have a teddy bear and I'd go, I'm Sophia's teddy bear. I'm Sophia's teddy bear. I'm Sophia's teddy bear. And like, I'd let the teddy bear kiss her three times. And she'd get all happy. And um, I guess the reason I'm sharing that is not because it's vinyl related, because it's really not. But I, I, you know, I did the kiss thing and um, I'm really embarrassed and feel all emasculated now. So I felt that uh, I need to cover my shame uh, with a story about my father so that you guys can just, um, you know, start respecting, (sighs) switch the tables. I'm so fucking done talking. I got nothing else to say. You can't tell. I got nothing to say. I'm done. Done. Hope you like it, all right? Cheers, guys.